I'm Simon Chapman. I'm Professor of Public Health at the University of Sydney. One of my research interests is in new technology and the way in which it sometimes generates concern and anxiety and beliefs that it's causing health problems in people who are exposed to it. Uh, for example, I've done work on mobile telephone towers and the way that about 15 years ago there was a peak of concern in communities which has almost but disappeared today as people become far more familiar with it. Now, wind turbines, of course, in recent years have started generating some anxiety and concern about health problems. And today I want to give you 12 things that you need to know next time you hear this uh, issue being discussed. The first thing is that modern wind farms have existed since the uh, early 1980s. And on the screen you can see a photograph taken this year in a village in France. And you can see that uh, that ancient village has got uh, or two wind turbines. I can see very, very close to it indeed. And the, the other photographs taken in Holland where you can see um, a couple of wind turbines right amongst uh, farming territory for, for tulips in this case. In fact, all over Europe, particularly in Denmark, uh, in Holland, in Germany, France, uh, Spain and parts of Portugal, uh, you can see uh, extensive uh, wind turbines and they've been there for many, many years. Um, there are about 225,000 turbines around the world today in 79 countries and China has, had, has got uh, the largest number with nearly 46,000 and it's experiencing uh, about a 39% annual growth in the erection of, uh, of wind turbines. So this is a major phenomenon that's been around for a long time. The next slide shows you the, the top 10 nations, uh, China, the USA, Germany, Spain, India, the United Kingdom, Italy, France, Canada, Portugal, uh, these are the, the countries which have got the most wind turbines. And as I said, these have been up in most cases for many years. In Australia, there are 51 wind farms. And the first was put up 20 years ago in Esperance in Western Australia. It's uh, still operating today. And uh, another old one was uh, established in Codrington in Victoria. And that was, that was put up in 2001. Um, but they're right around the country, particularly in southern Australia, in Western Australia, South Australia, Victoria, New South Wales, and to a lesser extent in uh, Tasmania, and there's one uh, um, in north, right in the north of Queensland as well. So the second point I'd like to emphasise is that health objections to wind turbines and wind farms are relatively recent in uh, occurring. Wind turbines uh, and farms have been established in the United States and Europe for over 30 years and yet the earliest claims about health harms appear to date from 2002, considerably uh, more recently than 30 years. Uh, and there has been an extensive increase in claims about health um, uh, appearing from around about 2009. So this immediately invites the question, well, why has there been this very, very long delay? Why have wind turbines been established in many parts of the world for many years with no apparent uh, concerns expressed about noise or health? And, uh, and then all of a sudden we see a growth in this. And the, the main proposition I want to put to you today is that we should think of um, complaints, health complaints about wind farms as being communicated diseases. I'll explain this as I go along. The third point I'd like to make is that opponents claim that there are immediate as well as long-term health impacts. And for example, you can see on the screen uh, a recent statement I saw that uh, the, someone was saying the onset of adverse health effects was swift within 20 minutes and persisted sometime after leaving the study area. So the notion that you can go to an area where there's a wind farm and you can immediately almost start feeling uh, ill as a result of the exposure to the wind turbines. So um, 
this raises again very interesting questions. Um, if they can cause instant impacts, well, why have there been uh, no uh, health complaints raised for many years, as we've just seen in the case of wind turbine wind farms, which have been up for a long time? And also, as we'll see shortly, in the majority of wind farms around Australia, there have been no complaints at all. So uh, if they can uh, cause instant effects, why aren't they causing instant effects in all wind farms? The fourth point I'd like to make is that even a majority of wind farms with large turbines, we're not talking about just the small ones, but those which have got really big turbines and often lots of them, um, many of these wind farms in Australia have had zero health complaints. So it's not just that it's the little wind farms which are not generating complaints, the majority of even the big ones are not generating complaints either. And I did a study earlier in 2003 where I looked at the history and distribution of wind farm complaints right around Australia. And what I found was is that 64.7% of all Australian wind farms and including 52% of the wind farms with the big turbines have never been subject to noise or health complaints. So we need to hold that thought in our heads and ask why that might be. The fifth point I would emphasise is that the number of people complaining about health or noise around wind turbines is very small. Now what I found was that in 33 farms around Australia that had had zero complaints, they have an estimated 21,600 residents living within five, kilometer, five kilometres of the turbines and they've operated complaint free for a cumulative total of 267 years. So in other words, you put all those farms together for the years that they've been operating, the ones that have had no complaints, and you've got 267 years of complaint, of complaint free time uh, in all of those wind farms. Um, what I found was that there are only 129 individuals that I could identify and we used three sources to identify them, parliamentary inquiries and complaints and submissions which had been put into those, media um, records of uh, people putting their hand up and saying that they were complaining and also the records of the wind farm owners. So putting those all three together we were only able to find 129 individuals around Australia which represents approximately one in 254 residents living within the five kilometres of those wind farms who have appeared to have ever complained. And in fact, in the entire states of Western Australia and Tasmania, we've seen no complaints. Now, the sixth point is that some people often will say, well, this is because only some people are susceptible to being disturbed or made ill from wind turbines. And they use the analogy of motion sickness, car sickness or sea sickness. It doesn't happen to everybody, it only happens to those people who are susceptible. Now to that I would say that if only susceptible people are affected, why are there no susceptible people around most wind farms? And why are there no susceptible people apparently in the whole of Western Australia and Tasmania? And why do susceptible people tend mostly to live near wind farms that have seen outside opposition groups, people who don't like wind turbines, come in and start spreading concern? I'll come to this point more in a minute. Seventh point I'd like to make is that you name it, opponents of wind turbines will say that these farms cause this problem. I've been collecting examples of this on the World Wide Web uh, since the beginning of 2012 and the latest tally that I've got is 223 different health problems and this list is growing every time I go back and try and look for some more. You can see I've, st I've got a few there uh, at the beginning of the list and I'll go on to the next page, it goes on and on. But my favourites are some of these. Bowel cancer, well bowel cancer is caused by what you eat. Lung cancer, lung cancer 
about 90% of lung cancer is caused uh, by cigarette smoking and the rest is usually caused by industrial chemicals uh, or um, what we call idiopathic, you know, a small number of lung cancers, we really don't know what causes them. Uh, herpes, uh, dancing cattle, the sudden death of 400 goats. This is a, seriously a report that was on the web attributed to wind turbines. Dental problems, loss of sex drive, hallucinations, your hair turning grey or your hair falling out, uh, people having problems praying, uh, hemorrhoids, uh, echidnas uh, losing their way and getting disoriented. And if you want to look up all of these, you can see the, uh, the link on the bottom of the screen there where you can go and have a look. Now, the next point I would make is that many of the most commonly named problems are very common in any community. Now, let's take sleep problems, for example. In this study on the screen of a large number of volunteer blood donors from New Zealand, um, now I'd make the point about people who donate blood that they're usually pretty, pretty in good health. Uh, if you're not in good health, you usually don't donate blood and they don't really want you to donate blood. But even in this relatively young, non-clinical cohort, lack of sleep, over one third of people complained of having lack of sleep problems, snoring 33%, and 20%, one in five of this uh, group, uh, have got high blood pressure. Now these are just three issues which are, for example, commonly named by people uh, saying, well, they're caused by wind turbines. They exist in any community regardless of whether they have wind turbines adjacent to them or not. The ninth point I'd make is that complainants have refused often to provide their medical records. So. If you said, well, I'm getting uh, problems of anxiety or depression or headache or nausea or whatever it happens to be, and I believe that these are being caused by wind turbines, well, it would be reasonable to say, well, how long have you had those problems? And uh, to ask those people to document how long, the, the claims about how long they'd had them. And medical records are, of course, one way that you can do that. I can go along to my general practitioner and I can ask for a copy of my medical records going back in my case, I've been going to the same GP for about 20 years. Now, where this happened in Canada and complainants were asked, they refused to provide them. And the Ontario Environmental Review Tribunal basically threw the case out, the case collapsed because uh, the people complaining just would ref refuse to supply the uh, medical records, which would have been highly relevant to the claims that they were making. Tenth point I'd make, is that most, most complaints about wind turbines, are, are, are they occur at wind farms which have been targeted by anti-wind farm groups, mostly after 2009. And you can see there that 94 out of the 129 people who have complained, or 73%, live in Australia just near six wind turbines. And of the 18 farms that have seen complaints, 83% have been targeted by the anti-wind farm groups and a large majority, 81% of health and noise complaints, commenced complaining after 2009 and this coincided with when the anti-wind turbine groups started really um, getting busy and moving from community to community trying to spread concern about these things. Now, the 11th point I'd make is that there have been 19 reviews of the evidence on wind turbines and, and uh, noise and health published since 2003. And you can see I've put some examples of quotes there, conclusions. There's no evidence that the audible or subaudible sounds emitted by wind turbines have any direct adverse physiological effects. Next one says, Surveys of the peer-reviewed scientific literature have consistently found no evidence linking wind turbines to human health. Low frequency noise or infrasound emitted by wind turbines is minimal and of no consequences. Um, what they do though say is that while there is no scientific evidence that noise at levels created by wind turbines could cause health problems, they can cause annoyance in some people. And of course, what happens when you are annoyed, this can lead to increasing feelings of powerlessness and frustration. 
And, and it's widely understood, of course, that if you're feeling annoyed, powerless and frustrated, this can be associated with adverse health effects over the long term. But what we need to emphasise here is that self-reported health effects, like feeling tense or stressed or irritable or having headaches or whatever, are, are associated with noise annoyance and not to the actual noise itself because we know that perception of sound as noise is very subjective and it's influenced by factors uh, so related to the sound but also to the person and the social and environmental setting. We know that some people fear noise itself and that there is great variation in the ways that people sort of perceive noise. Now, here we can see some very common settings in, in cities where, around the world where hundreds of millions of people live with much louder noise than are put out by wind turbines every day. Airline noise, traffic noise, the normal noise that we all live with day in and day out is much louder than the noise emitted by wind turbines. Um, in country settings where we find wind turbines, uh, for example, we often have loud noise of wind in trees, farm machinery, tractors, chainsaws, generators, and anyone in Australia who's been out in midsummer will have been sometimes nearly deafened by the sound of loud cicadas sort of going at, at, at full belt. So um, these, are no these are all things which we expect to hear in a country, which people believe are sounds which belong in country settings. But some people who don't like wind turbines say, well, they just get attuned and, uh, and, and highly sensitised to this news, the noise of a wind turbine because they basically don't like wind turbines and they get upset by the noise of those things while they can put up with this other noise all the time. Infrasound, the subaudible sound that uh, some critics claim uh, is causing all the problems, is not just uh, um, found in wind turbines, but it's found in storms. Anyone who lives near the sea is subject to infrasound uh, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. It comes out of motors, so we get it in our cars. It comes uh, from ceiling fans or subwoofers, uh, stereos, and it's coming out of my chest uh, through my respiration, my breathing and my heartbeat as I'm speaking to you today. I can't hear it myself, and you of course can't hear it, uh, but if I had sensitive enough instrumentation it could be measured and you would see that there was infrasound uh, in, the, in the room that I'm speaking to you now. Um, the twelfth point I'd like to make is that money may be a magic antidote to complaints. The National Health and Medical Research Council's review in 2010 made the point that people who benefit economically from wind turbines by getting rental for having them on their properties are less likely to report noise annoyance despite exposure to similar sound levels as those people who are not economically benefiting. This is, I think, a very interesting point. Now, critics will say that's because landowners who have turbines sign gag clauses. Well, in fact, they don't. Uh, in, uh, years ago, there were some of those uh, contracts around, but I've personally made it my business to ask uh, the wind turbine companies who are operating around Australia today to give me copies of blank uh, contracts, and I have not myself seen any gag clause uh, that would stop anyone complaining if they were having it. Lawyer friends have also told me that uh, in com under common law, um, claims of negligence, if you were trying to uh, make a claim of negligence against something which was harming you through a contract that you had signed, such as a wind turbine on your land, Com your common law rights would not be extinguished. They would not uh, the contract would not prevent you making that complaint if you were being harmed by something that uh, you were contractually subject to. So um, my view is that what we're seeing is what we call um, an incidence of psycho psychogenic illness. Psychogenic illness means a constellation of symptoms suggestive of organic illness but without an identifiable cause that occurs between two or more people who share beliefs about those symptoms. So what we've got here is a phenomenon where people come into an area 
incite anxiety around people, say all the sorts of horrible things that they believe that are going to happen to these people if, wind, if a wind farm is erected, and people start thinking, starting, start to get worried about it, start talking about it, their anxiety is raised, and they start thinking, oh, this is going to happen to me. Um, this is a phenomenon which has been known uh, throughout history. This is a uh, Francis Bacon writing uh, in the uh, 16th century uh, was saying that infections, if you fear them, you can call them upon you. And uh, more recently, um, people working in this area study what we call as nocebo effects. Nocebos are like, you've probably heard about placebo effects, that's when you're given a kind of an inert or sugar pill and told, look, take this, it'll probably make you feel better. And in a percentage of people who take uh, a placebo, they do feel better even after taking a pill which actually has no ingredient in it which is going to make you feel better. It's the thought of it making you feel better which makes you feel better. Now, nocebo is the flip side of that. If someone tells you that something is going to harm you or it's going to be painful or obnoxious or alarming, um, a percentage of people will experience those things when they're exposed to it, in this case wind turbines. Um, throughout history we've seen all sorts of technology uh, and predictions made about it. Uh, going back to the century before last, the invention of the telephone is an excerpt from the British Medical Journal where they were saying that telephones would cause all sorts of health problems and warning people about them. Um, I'm old enough to remember when televisions, computer screens, electric blankets, microwave ovens uh, and more recently mobile phones and towers and Wi-Fi and smart meters were introduced that people said, oh, all of these things are going to cause problems. Well, in fact, they didn't cause problems. We don't have epidemics of brain cancer in Australia uh, caused by mobile telephones in spite of the fact that there are more mobile telephones in use in Australia than there are population. Just about everybody well, has, got a, has got a mobile phone and many people have got more than one. So what is wind turbine syndrome? This is something which was popularised by a US doctor who interviewed a very small number of people. The slide I can see says XX people. I think the number was around about 30. Um, she interviewed them by phone. She didn't examine them. There were no medical records. The book has been hugely discredited and there are no peer-reviewed papers from it. And if you go to the National Library of Medicine and you look up wind turbine syndrome, you will see that it shows no items found. So this is not a phenomenon that is recognised at all in, uh, in the medical literature. I want to finish by profiling a few people who are leaders of the anti-wind turbine movement in this country. This is Sarah Laurie, who is the Chief Executive Officer of the Warborough Foundation. And um, a couple of quotes from uh, Sarah Laurie, which will indicate uh, perhaps uh, a flavour of the type of claims which are being made. Uh, Sarah Laurie says that uh, wind turbines can cause ground-borne vibrations and rapid fluctuations in barometric pressure sufficient to, at times, with sufficient energy to perceptibly rock stationary cars even further than a kilometre away from the nearest wind turbine. Think about that. She also says that wind turbines can make people's lips vibrate, now wait for this, from a distance of 10 kilometres away. Another man, Mr George Papadopoulos, he says, um, who on a, an anti-wind website, uh, tries to answer the, the question, where does the problem stop? And Mr Papadopoulos believes that um, he has been able to sense uh, wind turbines at a distance of 100 kilometres away. Now, 100 kilometres from where I'm standing now in the centre of Sydney is Lithgow, as, the, as the, uh, the crow would fly. So just think about that. So if it were true that uh, people could sense and be disturbed by wind turbines at a distance of 100 kilometres away, these concentric circles that 
drawn on the map of Victoria shows where all the people who would be living who could be affected by this, the entire population of Melbourne and indeed of southern Victoria uh, would be affected uh, in the way that Mr Papadopoulos believes that he is affected. Finally, the case of Mr Noel Dean of Warborough in Victoria. Mr Dean believes that wind turbines can actually charge his mobile telephone in the middle of a paddock away from everywhere. He says these things are damn dangerous. Now if that were true, I think the Apple Corporation might be very, very interested in wind turbines because they could do away with all the need to charge your phone. The final slide I'd like to show you is, shows why this whole issue is actually very serious. Um, the state of Victoria has a rule which says that no wind turbine can be erected within two kilometres of any residence. So on that map you can see it's just the white areas which are available for the erection of wind farms uh, in the state of Victoria. Very, very few. Most of the areas are no-go areas and of course that is severely limiting the rollout of wind energy, a very, very important form of renewable energy. This is why I think that we, all, we need to um, examine these claims that wind farms are causing health problems in the way that I've been doing today. So thanks very much for your um, attention today. I hope you found this interesting. Thank you.